the rapes, the crime, the statistics, the violence. We've had the attack that happened outside our Queen's house, outside Buckingham Palace, where, where a terrorist went and he tried to pull out and kill police officers. That was an Uber driver. We've set me multiple offences and terrorist offences are linked to Uber drivers. And that's why what this, what this was an attempt on, which it may be different. You see, Uber may be different in different parts of the world, in different cities. But in London, Uber is simply an Islamic ferry and it is driven by, by, by immigrants who have come here who are disrespectful to our women, disrespectful to our laws and disrespectful to our country. Obviously not all of them, but on par, that's what we see. Which is why I've, I've been very vocal against Uber. And Tommy Robinson is a best-selling author, publisher, patriot. He's got two books out. You should get them off his website. One of them uh, is, 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 is sold out right now. That's Muhammad's Koran. And he also works with uh, Rebel Media. We appreciate him joining us. And the reason I wanted to get him on was the bombing last week, and we've got him on now, which we now was an Islamicist uh, operation. Uh, Muhammad's Quran .com, That's at Tommy Robinson on Twitter. And we have Pakistan Muslims just today. Pakistan Muslims beat and rape Christian boy police side with the perpetrators, saying, "Well, it's a Christian. We're allowed to rape you." It's a, it, that's why the globalists like Islam. Is it's, a, it's a pedophile operation by the people that actually adhere to it. Islam is also our history. EU finance exhibition, you know, basically in a church, guts it and puts on Islam. Uh, but, but don't worry, the British school to be rated how trans friendly it is. Oh, wonderful. Go there immediately. And then I've got um, here Uber bans. Uber's banned in London because of mass Islamic rape. You know, using them basically as a spider hole. You think you're calling an Uber, you're really calling a refugee driving one. And then we got a guy that raped five little girls, including one seven, another refugee in New Hampshire. And the media is, of course, very, very happy to cover that up. So Tommy Robinson joins us right now from the what's left of the United Kingdom, from London stand, where Sadiq Khan told us twice in the last few years, get used to Islamic terror. Those are actual quotes. We, we probably cue that up again. This is just quite normal acid attacks. BBC tells you how to put makeup on after the daily acid attacks. So, Tommy, the only question is, why are you standing in the way of cultural enrichment? And uh, we now know these new refugees that carried out the bombing last week uh, had been brought in by the government in the last two years and were housed. They were children at, what, 21 years of age. So uh, this is all part of the sickening evil, uh, all, all part of the ceremony, I guess, of destroying Western culture. Well, what I can understand is the 21 years old, he's still housed with foster parents. And these foster parents were awarded, an, were given an award off of our Queen for housing. And all of these now, when you listen to the, the things coming out from them, the majority of the children they're now taking in are refugees from Syria, from Iraq, from Eritrea, from these places. But they're not children. As we were at the time, you know, at the time when all these children, these so called children, there was a big influx of them. We had celebrities, Gary Lineker, Lily Allen, all of them saying that everyone was racist or bigots, even Piers Morgan, for refusing to him. And at that, at that time, I went back and dug out a video we made at that time, which was just to point out, these are not children. These are not children, and they are going to come back and bite us. And that's exactly what's happened. And, and still now, that's the problem. It's not like, it's not like we learn anything from these attacks. It's a, it's a shame, because every time there's an attack, we think we'd be learning, but we don't. No, instead, your own prime minister and everybody else acted like Trump did it. Because Trump said it was a terror attack. He said it was Islamic. They said that was wrong. Of course it was. And then they said he was bad. It, the, our news over here was just Trump is evil. I know, I know. I know, I know. That's, all, that's all our news is. In, in fact, I just met someone earlier as part of a documentary. And he said exactly the same. As we're sitting there, it's all about Trump. And he, he said Trump, Trump called every Mexican a rapist. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. And all the things which he said, I said, this is the problem we have with the media or people like you. And, and I saw, I was actually away. I was in Spain as this was happening, as this terrorist attack was happening. And I saw the backlash against Trump. And it's simply, again, for telling the truth. And our mayor, I don't know, man. It, the only one good bit of positive thing that's come from the last three or four days is um, 
is Uber being banned in London, which is, for, for, for me, is great. Let's talk about that, because how much can people take? 10 million people the last five years, 80% military-age men, according to even the uh, UN, EU, and Interpol. They're just, they, I mean, there's so many Islamic attacks now, hammer attacks, acid attacks, knife attacks, including here and in Canada. I mean, I can't even keep track of them all. And just the raping, and the and you're walking your dog. They attack you because the dog's unclean. I mean, these are some really arrogant people. With regards to Uber, so London's London's black cab trade is the last predominantly white working class trade in London. Is that it's a four hundred year old historic industry. It's it's viewed upon as the fifth emergency service. If you're in if you're in trouble. You have the London Black Caps. They will help you. If you're a female on your own, they will save you. They will act as the eyes for the capital city. They are a skilled trade. They've worked for four years, and they have their business opportunity. They have, the, they they have the knowledge, as it's called, very famous, the model of cabs worldwide, so professional, so nice. Now you go to London, it is falling apart. Please continue. Yeah, that, that's it. So you have the knowledge, and we have, a th I believe, 20,000 Black Caps. Now, overnight... We had 100,000 Uber drivers. Now, you just have, anyone can see it. Uber drivers are Somalian, Eritrean, Syrian. They cannot even speak English. You see them so many times going up the wrong way, down one-way streets in London. <laughs> now, that's, before, that's before we get on to the rapes, the crime, the statistics, the violence. We've had the attack that happened outside our Queen's house, outside Buckingham Palace, where, where a terrorist went and he tried to pull out and kill police officers, that was an Uber driver. We've set me multiple offences and terrorist offences are linked to Uber drivers. And that's why what this, what this was an attempt on, which it may be different. You see, Uber may be different in different parts of the world, in different cities. But in London, Uber is simply an Islamic ferry, and it is driven by, by, by immigrants who have come here who are disrespectful to our women, disrespectful to our laws, and disrespectful to our country. Obviously not all of them, but on par, that's what we see, which is why I've, I've been very vocal against Uber. since. Well, I was about to say, what the Islamists do, it's like you go to any airport, Somalis are the only ones that run the, the parking areas, that run the cab areas, and that also run uh, the rental areas. I mean, I've been all over the big, big uh, areas, Minnesota, D.C., uh, Seattle. It's incredible. And I've asked them, and I looked it up. They have lobbies and guilds that go to the airports and lobby to have the lowest level bid. Then they all get on welfare, undercut everything. I know it's the same in your country. And then they take control. Then once they've got control of Uber, say, in London, then they only start hiring other Islamicists. That's how this works. It's exactly. Tommy Robinson's our guest. His Skype just broke out for a moment. He was saying that's exactly how it works. And again, it's all incredibly discriminatory, and it's happening using the West openness. You were saying that's exactly what's happening, Tommy. Uh, you're back. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what's happening. And if you go to Heathrow Airport, and actually what they were doing, I, I, I had a conversation. This, this is what really, where it really gets to me. I got in a taxi. I had a conversation with a cab driver who told me his life, his daily outgoings, his daily bills, how much he has to earn. Then he told me what happened when Uber got in. His whole marriage has broken down. He went, from, he went from working 12 hours to having to work 18 hours. He said he sleeps in his car. He's having, he's having to do this, but exactly the same. And this is the difference. When he goes home, he has a mortgage, he pays his tax, and he has a family. And they live in one home, one family in one home. The Uber drivers, the comparison, they're on benefits. They share a license amongst many of them. When they get home in one house, there'll be three or four families. They've all come in as refugees. They've all come in as immigrants. It's just not, it's not sustainable for an English man. What it does is drive down the wages and the culture, the giant sucking sound that Ross Perot talked about. Story, and you followed individual That's drivers, it. It and our, they're sleeping in their cars. It destroys our ability. And what we was nearly close to doing, you know, anyone from abroad in your countries, you look at London, you see what you see. The, the, the iconic thing would have been the red phone box. They're gone. The black cabs would have been gone. The black cabs are the last English trade in that capital city, for, you, for tourists to come over to our country and get into a taxi and speak to an Englishman. That is the final opportunity they have. Because once that black cab's gone, 
Once they've gone and that trade is dis it disappeared, then all you have is Somalians, there are trains. There's nothing left of London after that. There's nothing left of London. And that's where I, I said it's such an important issue. It's such an important issue. Well, let me issue. tell you my story. And, and I've been to England many, many times. The last time I was there, it happened twice. I would try to get a cab to the hotel that was very close to the airport. And because I was going all over England, so I wasn't going to stay in London itself. And I was at Heathrow. And they said, uh, sorry, it's, it's 50 pounds. And I went, well, I've asked. It's supposed to be like 10 to take me to the Hyatt that is literally a mile away. And I would go down the line and all the Muslims would laugh at me and say no. And they weren't just doing it to me. I thought maybe they know who I am. They were doing it to other families, people from Spain. They were doing it to people from Japan. Finally, there was one old British guy. He takes me for the 10 pounds. I give him like 20. He goes, this country isn't what it is anymore. They do that all day. I got to watch it. And nothing is ever done about it. I report it. Nothing's done. It's illegal. And these were cab drivers. You have to understand, okay, uh, you know, driving the black cabs and also the yellow ones and, you know, the old-fashioned looking cars. And it happened to me the next time. I mean, it's crazy. How do they get away with this? That's it. But mate, I've watched my whole life in the taxi trade in Luton where there's been actual murders. There's been murders and gang violence amongst the cab trades to control the streets. And it's like what I said. If you control the streets, you control the city, you control the town. And that's what happens. And you see them come in on massive numbers. As we've grown up in Luton with taxis, if there's ever a problem with a taxi, hundreds of them will come. But this is not the same. And, and you know what we get told? This is what we, we've been told. Because with the sex exploitation, the grooming gangs that we've all seen across the UK, the taxis, the Muslim taxis have been a pivotal part of that to ferry the children around. Now, what our politicians come out and say is the reason for this is opportunism. opportunism. And let me stop you there. Let me stop you there. You were the first to say a decade ago they were grooming girls in mass. Now, mainstream papers say per town, thousands of little girls, some of which end up being killed, many of which they're forced into sex slavery by the Muslims, and the police are so corrupt, they will do nothing about it. That, that's it. And it sounds so, it's, you know, if you listen to that, it sounds so crazy. That's, that's, that's how it is. 1,400 girls is, a, is, a, is an estimate. A low estimate. It's actually a lot more than that. That's in one small northern town. Yeah, now, they've identified 74 British towns. The Muslim gangs have been ferrying these children from one town to the other, all connected. They use taxis as a major way of doing this. Nothing's been done. Nothing's been done all, all over the years. Now, why? What, what we keep saying is because we get, we get told it's because, uh, uh, because of the opportunity. That's why these Muslim taxi drivers are involved in it. Well, non-Muslim taxi drivers aren't doing it. They're not ferrying it. Just, just today, Alex, just today, another four Muslim men have been found guilty and convicted in the city of Newcastle, where just three weeks ago, another 18 men were convicted in that same city. All Muslim men, all from different backgrounds, whether they be Turkish, Kurdish. Um, because part of Islam is sex trafficking women and children. It's what their business was before. It's what it was before that area was Muslim. The crossroads there at Mecca are on record to have been a slave trading uh, crossroads to the entire Middle East at that time. It's a fact. And women are lower than low under this culture. Sex slavery is legit, Mohammed said. I know if you read the life of Mohammed, you'll see it as he walked past one of his own men. He said, have you devoted her yet? Yeah, his, his other man said, no. He said, give her here. These are stories. And multiple times, if you pick up the Quran, it says multiple times you can take outside of your four wives, take whatever your right arm possesses, the arm of the sword. You can take non-Muslim women as sexual slaves outside of your four wives. That's right. You are seen as animals by the Muslims, and they teach them in their uh, madrasas to tell everybody they're friendly, everything's great, and then you are openly seen as an animal to be fed on because you're in the house of war, you're not in the house of Islam. But of course they can't stop it once they have total control, they just keep killing each other uh, because everything's the house of war because it is a giant army of pedophiles. So back in the early 1970s, they had arrested Glenn Danzig for wearing makeup on one of his shows uh, in um, London because he was a punk rocker. They want to lock us up, put us in their pretty pens. But now London isn't a British hell. <laughs> I think it's a nice city. It's an Islamic hell. And 
I want to ask Tommy Robinson and then intersperse some of your calls on a bunch of different subjects. Because Tommy's a smart guy, can comment on those. What does he think the big end game here is? We know the left's allied with Islam. We know this is happening. We know that a lot, most Muslims I know actually don't want to be under Orthodox Islam and are in their own bullied, crazy system. So let's be honest, a lot of them actually do just want to go get a degree and have a job and you know drink beer and watch football. But they're all henpecked by the men that control it. And then a lot of the imams are not these upstanding guys you hear, just like a lot of the Christians aren't. They are gangster controllers. And then I see Hillary, the, the uh, previous British government, the French and others supporting radical Orthodox Islam to take over and overthrow the countries where women go to college, where people want to get rid of the hijab, uh, where they want to be westernized. So I want to ask Tommy Robinson uh, of the uh, rebel media, best-selling author of Muhammad's Quran, which I know is out, sold out right now. And he also wrote a previous book, uh, what, uh, what is the enemy of the state? But, but Tommy, why, or, or, or if you disagree, explain it to me, why is the left selling out? Is it just for short-term power? Are the left historically so hate squares? Not that we're really squares, we just want to have a decent life and be, be honorable, that there's some type of weird cuckolding or they get off on allying with Islam because they're scared of it, because it won't compromise, and so they think it'll be their friend. Because the more you appease it, most of the Islamists go hit gay bars and liberal rock events. And, and I mean, the, 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 the Muslims tend to attack the people that are already bowing down to it. I'd, I'd say it's a mixture. I'd say what we're, seeing, what we're seeing politically in the UK is the left and the Labour Party understanding the future better than we do. Right? And so say, for example, in Luton again, if I, if I bring you back to Luton, the, the demographical change for Luton by 2030, now these are government figures. Now, for those who don't know who Luton is, Luton is, is my birth town. Luton's 30 miles north of London. It has a population of 200,000 people, 50,000 of which are Muslim. Now, the Labour Party regain power every year through the Muslim vote. That's every year. Now, but the, the, the demographical change by 2030, the Pakistani and Bangladeshi community are going to increase by 70 to 77 percent. Well, our community is going to increase by 1.3 to 1.4. So the Labour Party simply understand fully where the future lies in the town of Luton. Now, if I bring you to Manchester, I've, I've, been, I've been researching a lot for Manchester because I'm doing a talk. So it's a purely soon. sociopathic decision. But why did they begin the Islamic invasion? I mean, you have the plan going back what, 100 years ago with the Austrian count uh, who famously uh, had that whole Kalari plan where they wanted to do this. This has been a plan for a while. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say that's why I say it's a mixture of things. So on the ground in different cities, it's different people, different reasons, regaining power, keeping power, understanding that Islam is probably going to be help them with the future power of towns and cities. With regards to the flooding and the introduction of North Africa into Europe as one big superpower and bringing everyone together in order to have a, a grey-coloured grey -colored population, um, that's, that's a different story, I'd say, to what we're seeing. So that the, ori the original reasons for doing it and the original operation of doing it and the influx of people, whether it be this recent, recent refugee crisis, that differs there, to then when you get to the towns and cities for example, Manchester, which is where the last bombing was, the Islamic community doubled over 10 years. It's currently 100,000 people in that city. So in another 10, another 10 years, at the same rate, it will be 200,000 people. Now, Andy Burnham, who's the mayor of Manchester, the Labour Party mayor of Manchester, who was very vocal after the recent terrorist attack. Now, he works hand in hand, side by side, shares platforms with radical extremist organisations called MEN. One of the imams for men talking in a greater Manchester mosque, he told his congregation, and this is all this is all recorded, he told his congregation, all political parties will work with us because we now can we, we can swing the vote on 30 seats in Parliament. So let's explain. Because they vote as, as one cult block, it doesn't matter what the majority even wants. They will be under Islamic rule, which is desperately craved for 1400 years and is the religious race consciousness of the political movement well we recently had an election and labor gained 30 seats 
and Andy Burnham and all these people. That's the question that most people ask. Why would they be working with them? Why would they be hand in hand with the radical extremists? Because they will regain power and they will keep power. They will get, they will get power through work. With it. And that's exactly it. They organise. In Luton, we have the, the Central Council of Mosques and they have one leader. <laughs> and that one leader is in charge of 30 mosques. And he sits down and does deals with the council. And this is when we, that's what Americans need to understand, it's the point at which we become completely irrelevant. White English class, white working class, irrelevant. You're irrelevant in the scheme of the democratic process now. Remember that only 30 to 40 people in the UK, 40% of people in the UK now vote. So that's what we see at the, at, at the level of why now. Why are they doing this in this city? Why is it happening in this city? Why are they giving full Islam, Islam full control? Why are they getting everything they want? Because they regain power and they will keep power with them. Now, the original reasons for the flooding, which we've seen, when you look at what's happening in Sweden, I can sit there and cry. When I go through country from country and I hear the stories and read the stories, you probably do it yourself. You drive yourself insane. I read the stories daily of what's happening to women and what's happening at the hands of these men, what their men are saying to them. And just think that an invading army is coming to Europe, they're raping their way through it, and the European men are sitting on their backsides, sitting watching EastEnders on TV. And that, and it's just to pull your hair out of the cowardice that we've bred, the cowardice that we've bred. And it's like, and everything is siding on their side, whether it be the media, the politicians, the police, the government, it's all for them. It's all to help facilitate this invasion. Whilst you think you're sitting there pulling your hair out and screaming to your blue in the face, trying to oppose it or trying to highlight it, and trying to, not, trying to know, the maddest thing is trying to know what we should do to try and stop it. Because we can see it happening. And we can see the, we can see the change with our own eyes. Anyone can. And okay, it's like I had, a, I had an interview earlier where the, 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 interview, the man who was interviewing me was talking about how people were judging all these things on headlines in papers, which were fake news. I said, we don't need headlines. We see it with our own eyes. We know the people affected. We know the girls. We know the mums. We know what's happening. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting myself wound up and frustrated by it. I do it every time. Tommy, continue uh, breaking this down as, as somebody on the front lines who first really raised the alarm. Continue. Well, I first raised the alarm in 2004. First time. I, I, and, you, and this is all recorded. I organized a demonstration called Ban the Loot and Taliban. That's what I called it. And that was because at that time, what I wasn't aware of, after the Beslan massacre, after the Beslan massacre, I watched, on my, I watched online as local Muslims in my hometown, who I had no idea who they were, local Muslims in my hometown said, an attack like this will be justified on, a Brit, on an English school. Now, mark my words, Alex, an attack on our, one of our schools is coming, and it's coming soon. They are going to attack our schools. Every single school currently in the UK are practicing emergency lockdowns. The children have to hide under the tables. They have to act as though intruders are in the schools. That's what they're practicing now. I thought it was just my kid's school. I thought it was because it was my kid. Until I started speaking to other parents. And I see that these are going on across the whole country. They're getting the children ready because they know they're going to attack a school. We go to the Jewish schools. They've got bomb-proof windows. They've got massive, massive areas around them where they have men walking to protect them. We know that these people are going to attack our kids. We know it. And we know it. And they're doing nothing about it. Nothing about it. The men, the same men, are still walking our streets. They're still living amongst us. And, 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 and I first saw that in 2004. And that's when I started. And my eyes were opened to the, is, the Islamic ideology. I started reading and learning about who these people were. And they had a group in my hometown called al Mujahideen, Omar Bakri, Abu Hamza. Their base was in my town. And they were promoting. And I was so gobsmacked. The 21-year-old young English lad, I started looking and asked, who are these men? And how were they able to do this? And the 2004 was the first demonstration where I organised all of our men from football to come out and protest against them. And it was called Ban the Loot and Taliban. And in the leaflets, it made it clear. Whites and blacks, I've still got copies of these leaflets. Whites and blacks are being religiously and racially targeted. Our women are being sexually abused and groomed. These men have come into our communities and they're selling heroin. If we know what shops... I know what shops they use to sell heroin. If I know what shops, why are the police not stopping them? Why are they not stopping what's happening? And, and, and every single thing that you go along, every single thing, it's just the, the, the level, the two-tier level of policing 
And the, the way they allow them, what they're allowing them to do to our town, that was the start for me in 2004. And I've not closed my eyes. It's impossible to close your eyes. No well, that's the next thing. They eyes. called him a hooligan, one football fan at the London Bridge attack. They called him the Lion of London Bridge fought off and fought three guys stabbing him and saved a bunch of people. And the media kind of halfway criticized him for even daring fight. Like you're supposed to show your neck to the Muslim and say, plunge your knife in here. And then the police always pose with him and the government defends him. Even Theresa May backhandedly attacks Trump. I mean, this is sick, 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 sick behavior. But then if you mildly criticize Islam, as you've been arrested and harassed many times, but now they leave you alone some of the time because they know you won't back down and you have attention. They go to universities where students criticize ISIS and they get in trouble. Or people criticize a terror attack and the police come after them like they've done something wrong. Alex, I'll send you a message. When I hang up for me, I'll send you a message I received today from a 14-year-old school child. A 14-year-old school child who, when they were talking to him about Islam, he pointed out to them in school that it's, like, it's, it's dangerous for our country. The teacher had a go at him. They then began speaking about the burqa, at which point he said it's a threat and it needs to be, it, it should be banned. He was sent out of class, kicked out of his school class. Is and this your son? No, this isn't my son. This is, this is a 14-year-old a school child who's contacting me today. I received messages. I received messages from school, another school child. Many of them are school children because what's happening in our education system, you're not allowed an opinion. You're not allowed to tell the truth. Well, no, but I've been reading where they even take them to mosque. They make them go to mosque. Every, every single child goes to the mosque. Every single child goes to the mosque. Now, and it would take me, this is what winds me up. You give me the name of the mosque that they're taking them to and give me 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes, I will find you hatred. I will find you extremism. I will find you past speakers who are bigots, who are fascists. Who, the, the, the sheer fact that you're bringing our children to these places, the, the sheer fact that you're doing that, and, and that we're supposed to just... And you know when some parents say they don't want their children to go? They have to sit outside the office. Like they've done something wrong. Like they're being punished. And that's the problem even in the education system currently now. I had one child messaging me who was then suffering from mental health issues because of the targeting he had at school. He said the police, two, two men in suits, which were police officers... Come to see him because he said Islam is a fascist ideology and a violent ideology. And that's the truth. You're penalising our children for telling the truth. I've, I've seen this myself. I've seen this with my own children. I've seen what's going on in schools. I've seen what the teachers are pushing. Tommy, what do we do? I mean, what do we do to stand against this? It's, 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 it's knowing that that is the question. And all I've said is, for years, I've had this even off my wife. You can imagine my wife, my mum and dad just saying, stop, 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 stop. What can you do? What can you do? And this is where even my, my wife's nan, I come home, Muslims were setting fire to poppies. They were burning poppies on Remembrance Day, on our most important day, during a two-minute silence. And they were screaming, burn, soldiers, burn, British soldiers, burn. And I was arrested that day for trying to prevent them burning, burning those poppies. Now... When I got home, my wife's, my wife's nan was there with her mum. And they said, you've been arrested again. I said, yes, I have. You expect me to stand there while men burn our most, our, our, our most sacred symbol, whilst our old people have to walk down the street and hear terrorists screaming, burn, soldiers, burn, British soldiers, burn. I said, no. And, and, and then she said, it's too late. It's too late. And I said, this is where we have to really rise up. because It's not too late. It, it's a dangerous time. But realistically, 5 to 10% of our country is Muslim. If everyone had that opinion, that, that weak opinion, that, that, that opinion that is too late in, in the 30s, we'd all be German and we'd all be frog marching doing, doing Hitler salutes. And, and people didn't have that opinion. No people back then would run, they'd kiss their family goodbye. They'd be 14 years old and they'd be lying and pretending they're 16. They'd be pretending they're 16 so they could go out and die and fight for Britain and save our country. And right now, everyone's scared to even pull their curtains back or talk. People are scared to open their mouths. And that's because they've got most people financed up to the hill, mortgaged up to the hill, in a position where if you talk at work, you lose your job, and then you can't provide for your family, which I'd say has purposely been done, been done as well. So they've got a populace that is, can be controlled through fear and intimidation, starting at the top. As soon as you express your free speech, they come banging down on you and beat you down. And I, this is time and time again, you see people... In every, in, in every industry in the UK who are losing their jobs, 
being penalised and being, being being taken in for simply telling the truth about Islam. Now, I, I remember going to East Germany last year and meeting men from East Germany who were protesting these issues. And they said, we've seen this before. I said, what do you mean? He said, this is communism reinvented. We've seen it. You can't talk about it. Shh. You lose your job. You can't speak about it. He said, it, what we're seeing now with the, the way that these older men, he goes, we live through this. We live through this. We've, it's exactly the same. It's just a new enemy. It's a new ideology. It's Islam and exactly the same. And that's why you see in countries like East Germany, in the Czech Republic, in these countries that know what it's like to fight for your freedom, they fully understand what's happening. And they're fully out on the streets. They're prime ministers, whether it be the president of Czech Republic, whether it be their politicians in Hungary, whether it be people who have experienced this oppression on your, on your freedom. They know what it's like. You go to West Germany, West Germany compared to East Germany, they're all embracing it and sucking it up. They think it's something to be celebrated. They have no idea. We have, we have no idea. In our generation growing up, we think that this is how life is. We think that life's perfect and it's easy and there's no war. And, and Britain and, and, and the, the, the things that are happening around the world won't happen in Britain. Well, they are happening. We've seen them happening. Four terrorist attacks in the last four months. They're going to happen. And Islam will do exactly the same to our country as it's done to every other country it's ever gone All to. All right, Tommy Robinson, stay there. We're going to come back and take calls on a bunch of different issues. But the reason I raise all this is... There's the entitlement by the Islamic system. Now that their numbers are high enough, they know they've compromised our governments. They are very arrogant in major publications that they're going to conquer us. They say your women belong to us. And now the police in most areas treat them like they are godlike royalty. So I want to ask, why are the Islamists so arrogant? Is that all that, I mean, just what is it? And, and we'll discuss it all. Tommy Robinson is our guest. We have a very informative guest, the owner of a wonderful radio station up in Chicago, Matt Dubiel, that carries our show. He's going to be hosting the fourth hour. I, I know I should go to these calls, Jeremy and Angie and Ryan and Dan and Nick. We're talking to Tommy Robinson, and there's all these other subjects there. But if you want to know what we're facing as a culture and a society, just look at what the government's doing with Orthodox radical Islam. And it, it tells you, and, and we really are under assault. And our elites are allied with it. They didn't go into the Middle East to defeat it. They went in the Middle East to knock out the guys that weren't bad to put the bad guys in charge. And that's now declassified. Obama and Hillary did help create ISIS. The Democrats are trying to block Trump crushing ISIS. So this that's why the Hollywood hates Russia, because they're fighting Islam. Tommy, your take on Russia and all the demonization of Russia and the fact that they've gone back to being Christian and are fighting for their survival as well in Eastern Europe. You know, not, not committing suicide. That that may be the only areas left in the West is what what used to be the what, pure West, uh, politically and Christian wise, until it got overrun by Islam dozens of times. That's why they have the ancestral memory uh, of uh, being overrun. I mean, you've just been to Europe. Can you speak to that? Yeah, if you, if you look at Eastern Europe, it'd be Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, which I can see now the EU will now attempt to destabilize those countries and destabilize their governments. That's what I believe they will do because. They are the last defence. They are, they are actually speaking for their people. Putin is speaking for his people. And, and when, you see, when you see what the Czech Republic, what Poland, what Hungary are saying, the reason they're so honest is because they don't have millions of Muslims in their country that will blow things up and go all sort of shit and crazy as soon as, as, soon as, as, soon as Sank said. Whereas in our countries, you know, you know in Britain, if we didn't have four million Muslims... Our, our, our leaders would be talking very differently about Islam. Our, they, they would be, but once we're infected and it's in our country, which it is, and it's so powerful in our country, and it's so dangerous in our country, all of our leaders bend over backwards. And that's what we're seeing. So we, we, I, I look, and I think the rest of us in Europe need to look to Eastern Europe. We look to them for guidance and help in, in the problems that we're going to face. And um, you're right again about all this demonization about Putin. I don't understand it. I don't understand it in the sense that he, in the sense that he's not a coward and he's a man, and that, and that's the that's what seems to be the problem. And I know, like even one of Putin's top representatives, when they were talking about the problems in France, he said, well, "If your police were used to dealing with real things instead of just having LGBT rights, which look, I know there's problems in Russia as well, but the reality is, we as Western Europe have become so weak and pathetic, so weak and pathetic. And when you look to Russia, you see real men." When I look to Hungary, I see real men. When I look to Poland, I see real men. That's what I see. And that's why 
I'm frustrated at, uh, at the, the average man that we've created in the West. We've become so weak. So, in your gut, are they going to win? I mean, will the West just commit suicide? The West is in the process of committing suicide. Um, I see this is the problem. This is where it gets so... There is no peaceful solution to this. There is no way of sorting this problem out without utter chaos. Now, there's no way. So it can't be sorted, but at some point, we will have to have that art of chaos. Now, it's either people, the government's accept it and try and deal with it now. Now, I, I think it will happen when the pen gets in or when builders gets in or Sweden, when one political party gets in that tries to enforce the law. The law the laws are already there. Try to enforce the law upon the Islamic community, we will see mass carnage. Mass carnage. And that will spread across the whole of Europe. But that, has, that, that day has to happen. It has to come. Final 30-second comment, Tommy. Final 30 seconds comment, America, if you're watching this, please learn from our mistakes. Please learn. You have to look at us. You have to. If I had one thing, I would, I would wish someone come to my country 20 years ago, and I would wish they told me. I would wish that our government were warned, that our people were warned. This is what's going to well, happen. Well, you're, you're a modern Paul Revere. Thank you, Tommy. I'm going to take calls and hand the baton to Matt Dubiel. Stay with us, ladies and gentlemen. Infowars.com, newswars.com. We'll be back this Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. Central. In ancient times, man roamed the earth in a constant state of hunting or being hunted. Introducing Caveman, where cutting edge science meets ancient super nutrients. Secure your bottle right now at InfoWarsStore.com.